All right, are all the judges ready? And the timer? And the negative two? Yeah. There once was a man living in the United States, and he decided to invest some of his money in Ukraine. Ukraine and U.S. had something called a Bilateral Investment Treaty, or BIT, which means that the investments were protected, and some of the risks of investing in another country are reduced. So the story goes on that the man that invested his money in Ukraine got his money taken away by a Ukrainian corrupt official. Now, because both of these countries had a BIT, he was able to sue the Ukrainian government directly and get his money back. However, this is not the case in all the countries that U.S. investors try to invest in. For example, in 2003, there were many U.S. investors investing in a Russian company. Now, this, since Russia and the United States do not have a BIT, the Russian government decided to take some of this investor's money away. Because they didn't have a BIT, they weren't able to sue the government and get their money back. And it's estimated that they ended up losing $6.7 billion because the U.S. and Russia lacked a BIT. So because the, our investors deserve to be protected abroad, the affirmative team stands for resolved that the United States federal government should significantly reform its policy towards Russia. Now in this debate round, we're going to start off with observation one, definitions. Further definitions are available upon request. Bilateral Investment Treaty, or abbreviated BIT. This is a key definition, and we'll go slow here just to make sure we can all get it in our notes. BITs are international treaties from or with two sovereign states on the mutual promotion and legal protection of investments by private persons or companies from one country to the other country. Each country has their own model text, and what we're going to be using today is the U.S. 2004 Model BIT. And these are four concepts of this BIT that we need to understand. The first concept is confiscation refund, which means if a U.S. or Russian company investing in the other gets its money taken away by a corrupt official, then under a BIT, the company would get this money that or would get fully refunded by the corrupt official's government, thus protecting their investment. The second concept is free investment transfer. When either a U.S. or Russian company invests in the other under a BIT, they get the money that they earn from their investment without having to pay a fee, so there's no fees. The third concept is freedom from export quotas, which is when there's a restriction imposed by a government on the amounts of goods or services that may be exported within a certain amount of time. So if these um, companies that are investing in each other also want to buy products from one another, then under a BIT, they're able to do so without any limits. So under a BIT, there's no limits. And the fourth and final one is dispute resolution. If the companies have a dispute or disagreement, they now have the opportunity of hiring a mediator or suing the foreign government directly and taking it to the International Court of Justice, or ICJ, where it's under, under international law, bypassing the entire local court. So there's legal recourse. So overall, a BIT is just legal protection or investment insurance. Now we're going to go on and look at what the status quo is doing right now. And observation two, the status quo. Fact number one, you can write this down as no BIT. There's no BIT. Aslan and Kuchins laid out the facts in March 2009 when they said, quote, the United States does not have a ratified BIT with Russia, unquote. However, back in 1992, Russia and the U.S. actually negotiated and signed the BIT. The U.S. ratified it. But in 1993, when it came around to Russia's turn to ratify it, they didn't. The reason behind it, interestingly enough, was Russia was in a state of political upheaval. They were during, or they were having their constitutional crisis after the Cold War. And the parliament had actually been completely dissolved by the then president, Boris Yeltsin. Now, the situation ended, but not only after they used military force. And the issue of a BIT didn't actually surface again until 2008, when Russian and U.S. leaders attended the 2008 April Sochi Declaration, which is where the U.S. and Russian leaders got together and talked about relations for the future, which included a BIT. However, since the negotiations weren't started until the end of 2008, Bush didn't have time to finish the treaty because his presidency was over. And President Obama has not continued this throughout his presidency. However, Russia has still clearly stated it is a priority in our relationship. Samuel Sheriff and Kuchin stated in February 2009 that, quote, the United States should pursue a new BIT with Russia. According to his leadership, Russia welcomes the session agreement with the United States. The April 2008 Sochi Declaration declared the new creation of a BIT a major priority in their relationship, unquote. Fact number two, investors are unprotected. Investors, U.S. and Russian investors, do not enjoy the benefits of a BIT. Andrew Kuchin explains the importance of this when he says in 2009 that, quote, 
One reason direct U.S. investment in Russia is so, is so low is because the U.S. does not have a ratified BIT with Russia. As a consequence, U.S. corporations usually invest in Russia through European subsidiaries that enjoy better legal protection. So because there's no BIT, U.S. investors do not invest directly inside of Russia. Because they go through European subsidiaries and not investing directly, we lose much of the money that we could gain because it goes through so many middlemen. Now we believe as the affirmative team we can make the status quo much better in our observation three, the plan. Our agency and enforcement will be the, come from the U.S. Trade Representative, the President, and any other necessary federal agency. Our mandate is that the U.S. will begin negotiations, sign, and ratify a BIT with Russia. We will negotiate, sign, and ratify a BIT with Russia, which will be based off of the 2004 U.S. model BIT that we talked about. It will include, but is not limited to, the four concepts that were established, being one, corruption protection, two, no fees, three, no limits, and four, legal recourse. No funding should be needed, but if there is, just to cover all of our bases is, is going to come from the State Department budget. Let's go ahead and examine the advantages that will come about after passing the affirmative team's plan. Advantage number one, investors are protected. U.S. and Russian investors will now be protected with no, one, number one, corruption protection, two, no fees, three, no limits, and four, legal recourse. Advantage number two, U.S. benefits. The U.S. gains many benefits. For instance, Aslan and Kuchin said in 2009 that a BIT would also encourage Russian investment in the United States. Foreign investment not only provides jobs for Americans, but it also fosters economic independence, unquote. Besides the jobs that Americans get, economic independence would make it cheaper and more rewarding for the trade between Russia and the United States. This in turn would decrease costs and increase profits of U.S. benefit or businesses, which when they would then be able to hire more employees and lower prices. For the average American, this means cheaper food and gas, and definitely more jobs. Advantage number three, Russian growth. Russia's growth. Economic growth on Russia's side, as Samuel Sheriff stated in January 2010, that, quote, the converse, that stronger economic relations with the United States could increase prosperity in Russia, is another reason to pursue integration. Greater prosperity in Russia will add to the ranks of the country's middle class. So it will be increasing prosperity for Russia as well. Now you might be wondering, well, why would we want to enlarge the middle class over in Russia? Why is that such a big deal? Well, it turns out that a larger middle class would make them better trading partners for the United States. So as iron sharpens iron, so too will our economies help each other to grow. Now, the current system is not doing all right. We see that there are some major improvements that can be made. And as the affirmative team, we believe that in order to make these improvements, we have to pass a BIT between the United States and Russia. We will be protecting and helping investors, similar to the ones that we mentioned at the beginning of this speech, that lost $6.7 billion because the U.S. and Russia lacked a BIT. Russia has clearly stated that's a major priority in our relationship, yet Obama has refused to look at this. So for all these reasons, I strongly urge an affirmative ballot. I stand now saying over for questions. All my judges are right? Am I timer? All right. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Just a couple questions about your speech. First off, could I have a copy of it, please? Absolutely. Thank you. And then can I have a copy of the 2004 model of the BIT, please? I'm going to sit back to the table. We can get it for you in just a second. All right. Thank you. Okay. So moving on to talk about uh, Bush's negotiations. Now, how long did President Bush negotiate BIT? Um, it was started in the last months of this presidency. I believe it was started in either June or August of 2008. All right. So how long would it take Obama to negotiate a BIT with Russia? Well, if you look at historical presidents, last time it only took us about 6 to uh, 12 months. If we look at historical presidents of U.S. BITs with other countries, since we have about 40 of them, it takes about a year for each of them. Okay. Now, you mentioned that political upheaval was the only reason Russia didn't accept the last BIT. Now, was that the only reason? That was the main, yes, I believe that was the only reason, because the Russian right. parliament was not there. All right. Now, could the BIT change during negotiations with Russia? Could they edify, could they edit it? Well, they're going to be negotiating it, definitely, but overall we do have a guaranteed protection of investors. Okay. Now, do you guarantee that negotiations won't let Russia change the goals in your plan? Um, no, but BITs, that is the only goal that a BIT has, so no, there, it won't be changed with our plan. All right. Now, what is the current state of Russia's economy? Um, Russia's economy, I believe it's doing much better after the global recession hit in 2008. Okay. So moving on to talk about the enforcement of a BIT. Now, what enforcement does a BIT offer? 
of an enforcement, are you talking about for the treaty itself? Or? Yeah, how, do, how does the BIT offer us enforcement to stop Russia from being corrupt, as you said? Well, essentially, we're not stopping Russia from being corrupt. We're protecting our investors from that corruption. We're not solving corruption. Okay. We're protecting investors. But the, coming back to the enforcement side of it, mm -hmm. it's handled by international law. Because once okay. the U.S. and Russia sign this treaty, it's held by international law. Okay. Now, who will, the Russia, who will Russian leaders who mishandle our money be subject to if they were to violate the terms of the BIT? Well, essentially, the process starts off as the United States company, if it gets its money taken away by a corrupt official, then the U.S. economy or the U.S. company sues the Russian government directly, and then it's taken to an arbitration court, which is like the okay. International Court of Justice. All right. All right. So moving on, uh, just one final question. So would your plan ideally increase U.S. investment in Russia? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. No further questions. No problem.